Let's lift our voices to our God and sing him number 19, please. 19.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now in prayer, thinking of your Son. Father, we're so thankful for the plan, the scheme of redemption that you have put in motion all for us. Father, we know that we did not deserve one ounce of the blood of Christ, but nonetheless, you shed it all for our sakes. We're so thankful for the body that was prepared for him and for us, the body that was broken and tortured for our sakes, for our own sins, Father. We know that we deserve that, but yet he took our place. Father, let us think upon that sacrifice now at this time. Thank you for loving us. It's in the name of your Son that we pray these things. Amen. with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come around this table to partake of this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for our sins. We ask that you would help us to turn our minds back to that scene that we might find ourselves worthy to partake of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
That concludes the memorial service now. As a matter of convenience, we'll take up the offering. So pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for this opportunity we have to give back a portion of thy means that you have blessed us with. Father, we pray that as we give back, we do so generously and with a cheerful heart that will be acceptable in your name. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Five hundred forty-four, five four four. Let's be standing as we sing, please.
We have been blessed with a very brisk yet beautiful morning. It's great to see everyone here at this time that we can worship our God together in spirit and in truth. I want to welcome visitors who are with us. We know that we have some, and it's good to see Angie, good to see Jennifer and the children. Uh, they're here because of Doug and Bobby, so we're thankful for that. Remember, we have a, a lot of announcements that were made already. Uh, remember our sister Janice Howell. She'll be having surgery tomorrow. Again, it's good to see Brother Dennis Hilton today. Uh, the first time he's been able to be back with us since his surgery, and I can only imagine how much effort it takes to get here, and so we're thankful to see Dennis and Tessie. Likewise, remember that our marriage seminar is fast approaching next Friday and Saturday. Glenn and Cindy Colley, Glenn will be teaching the men, Cindy, lessons for the ladies concerning marriage. And so let's all sign up. It was announced that today's the last day. Make sure that you sign up for this great, great event. Remember, we're having after services a luncheon. Uh, in honor of Doug and Bobby, and it's been called a going away, but we miss that. It's either a gone or a coming back, and I'm, I'm holding out for the latter. Well, I'm going to call it a coming back luncheon, so let's all be ready to share in their joy. This morning, the lesson that we're presenting, blessed is that servant. Did you listen to the scripture that was read just a moment ago? Matthew 24 and verse 46. This phrase is incorporated in it. You see, at the end of Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about his coming. And he's telling us to be watchful. He's instructing us to be ready. He wants us to be someone who is doing when he returns. And so look at three verses. Matthew 24, verses 42, 44, and 46. Read these with me. Here's where he says, watch. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So he's coming, but he wants us to watch. He wants us to be ready. Look at verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then, of course, the verse from which we get our title, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Blessed is that servant. A couple of questions that we want to ask based upon this title as we begin. And, of course, the first one, what servant is blessed? What servant is he talking about that is blessed? What servant is happy? What servant is divinely fortunate? And as important as that question is, am I that servant? Does my service please my master? Let's not just sit here this morning and think about, quote, slaves or servants at arm reach. Let's put ourselves in this equation. I am to be a servant of my Lord. And so am I that servant? Am I that blessed servant? Am I that happy servant, that servant who is divinely fortunate? Am I the servant that is pleasing God with my service? You remember 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9? We have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Paul says, that's my ambition, and that likewise should be ours. It should be our goal. It should be our purpose in life. As a servant, as a steward, it is required of a steward to be found faithful, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. You remember 2 Timothy 4, uh, 2 and verse 4? No soldier in active duty entangles himself in the everyday affairs of this life in order that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Well, that's what we want to do. 
We want to be that servant. We want to be a servant that is pleasing. Again, different kinds of servants. Now, this is from Malachi 3 and verse 18. I tried every which way to get the verse on here. Couldn't. So I want you to know, taking notes, write down Malachi 3 and verse 18. Here, here's a great statement here. Then you shall again discern, now notice this, between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and one who does not serve him. I think we all know this, but let's be reminded. All humanity is divided into two categories. And here they are represented. Either the righteous or the wicked. Malachi is saying we can discern between those two. And either those who do not serve God or those who do serve God. Again, we can discern between those two. Even in your own life. You remember in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 17, the church at Laodicea? We're rich, we're wealthy, we're in need of nothing. Jesus said, you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They had a problem discerning. Why? Because they weren't looking at the facts. Again, we should be able to tell who is serving God and who is not serving God. We should be able to look at our own lives and honestly, objectively, ask the question, am I? Am I truly serving my God? Am I that servant? Am I blessed, happy? And so Malachi 3 and verse 18, look at this first caption, those who do not serve him. Well, in Matthew 24 and verse 48, it speaks of evil servants. Oh, they might claim all day that they're serving their master. They're not. They're evil. Again, we also see wicked and lazy. Matthew 25 and verse 26. Some translations, wicked and slothful. Now once again, look at the one talent man. Claimed to be serving his master, but he wasn't. He was evil. He was wicked and lazy. Likewise, unprofitable in that same context. Cast out the unprofitable servant. Matthew 25 and verse 30. Those who do not serve the Lord, their master. There are servants of mammon mentioned in Matthew 6 and verse 24. You cannot serve God and mammon. So once again, there's that great divide. You're either serving God or you're serving mammon. Those who do not serve God, many times, here's the problem. They love riches. The love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. So servants of mammon, servants of sin. You remember Jesus in John 8, 34. The one who commits sin is a servant or a slave of sin. And so servants of sin and also servants of self. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. I want you to take your Bibles. Let's read this context because as I've said many times throughout the scriptures and many times possibly in our own lives, we see in the scriptures those who claim to be serving God. We look and we see others who claim to be serving God. We say we are serving God. We better look every day. We better examine ourselves often. You remember Haggai 1 and verse 5, consider your ways. Remember Lamentations 3 and verse 40, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return again to our God. Well, notice, here are some, and once again, claim, I'm sure, to be serving God. Notice what Paul says by inspiration, though, about them. Look at Romans 16. Read with me verses 17 and 18. It says, Now I urge you, brethren... Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. Now notice what he says, verse 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. He says, they don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. They serve their own belly. They serve themselves. And again, remember, that's what Malachi is saying. 
We can discern between the righteous and the wicked. We can discern between those who do not serve God and those who do serve God. Notice, servants who say, we're still talking about those who do not serve as they ought. These are servants who say, give me. You remember Luke 15 and verse 12? That's what the prodigal said on his journey away from the father. When he's leaving his father's house, when he's headed towards that far distant country, give me. Servants, true servants, faithful servants, they don't say give me. It's the evil servants. It's those who are, you know, unprofitable, those who are wicked and slothful, lazy. This is their attitude, give me. Also, their attitude is, please me. You remember Romans 15 and verse 3? Scripture tells us there that Jesus did not please himself. Well, he's our great example. As a servant of him, how can my attitude be, give me? How can my attitude be, please me? Again, servants who say, serve me. Again, just the very opposite of what servants should say. In Matthew 20 and verse 28, remember Jesus says that he did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, once again, when my attitude is serve me, please me, give me, then I'm one who does not serve the Lord. I serve myself. I serve my own belly, as the Bible says. Those who serve him. Notice this. Go back to the book of Exodus and notice how many times God, through Moses and Aaron, say to the Pharaoh. Notice, and especially this last thing, but read all the verse with me. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, say to him, Thus says the Lord. Now listen to this. Let my people go. You know, typically we stop there. Let my people go. Talking about this freedom here, this liberty. But again, this was liberty with a purpose. This was freedom with a goal in mind. Let my people go. Why? Well, let my people go that they may serve me. That's what God's always said. You remember 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17? Come out from among them and be ye separate. Again, we're to, we're to let go of this world. We're to say, you know, go out of the world like, just like Egypt. Why? So that we can serve our Lord. Let my people go that they might serve me. Again, that's the goal of humanity. That's the very purpose. Fear God and keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. And so, again, those who serve him, they understand this. They recognize this. Well, faithful and wise servants. Of course, Matthew 24, verse 45. And likewise, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, verse 21, and also mentioned later. But these are servants, those who serve the Lord, those who did not serve him, and those who did serve him. Now look at this. Servants who say, remember what we said earlier? Servants saying, give me, and servants who say, please me, and servants who say, serve me. Well, here's just the opposite. Make me. Make me. Again, we talked about the prodigal when he left. Luke 15 and verse 12, give me. Give me the share of the inheritance that falls me. When he comes back repenting of his sin, he's not saying, Father, I wasted your inheritance. Give me more. No, he's coming back saying, make me. Make me one of your hired men. I just want back into your house. There's the beginning of servanthood right there. Make me. Use me me. Write down 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 20 and 21. You'll see in that context, in a great house, there are both kinds of utensils Paul is talking about, silver, gold, wood. But he says the one who cleanses himself from these things. 
He is, among the things he says, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Useful. We approach God, we're saying, make me, make me your son, make me one who can bring honor and glory to you, and, and use me. I want to be useful to you, and also send me. Instead of serve me, no, send me. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Here am I, send me. Well, blessed is that servant. Quickly think about these with me. Blessed is that servant who serves God exclusively. Who only serves God. What did Jesus say in Matthew 4 and verse 10? You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so blessed is that servant who serves God exclusively. Blessed is that servant who serves him in reverence and with godly fear. Listen to Hebrews 12 and verse 28. It talks about having received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The Hebrew writer goes on to say, let us have grace. Now listen to this. By which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Friend, that's the only way that you can serve God acceptably. With reverence and godly fear. Blessed is that servant who serves God exclusively, who serves him in an acceptable fashion with reverence and godly fear. Again, blessed is that servant who serves with humility. You remember what Paul said in Acts 20 and verse 19? Paul is speaking there. Paul is talking about his service, serving the Lord with much humility and with many tears. Again, as we said earlier, the only way you can serve God acceptably is with reverence and godly fear. The only way we can serve God is with humility. God is opposed to the proud. Gives grace to the humble, James 4 and verse 6. So blessed is that servant, think about this, who serves the Lord with gladness. Write down Psalm 100 in verse 2. That's how the verse begins. Serve the Lord with gladness. And if you're not going to serve the Lord with gladness, you remember Deuteronomy 48 and verse 47. It states in that context, because you did not serve the Lord with joy and gladness. For the fullness of everything goes on to say, you'll serve your enemies. Well, that's a striking verse there. I want to serve God. I want to serve him acceptably. Thus, I want to serve him with gladness. I want to be thankful for everything he's done for me. And let that gratitude spur me on to do what he wants me to do. Serve the Lord with gladness, who serves fervently. Blessed is that servant who serves fervently, not lagging behind in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12 and verse 11. That's the kind of servant I know that we all want to be. Let's examine ourselves. Let's make sure that we are that servant serving fervently who serves with all of his heart. This is sort of like Matthew 22 and verse 37. We serve like we love. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Well, we serve in the same way. Listen to the beginning of 1 Samuel 12 and verse 24. Samuel is talking to his people, his brethren, and he says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart. You see, the Old Testament taught us to do the same thing. You serve him just like you love him. You serve him with all of your heart. Well, notice this. Who serves because of all that has been done for him. You know the latter part of that verse? Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all of your heart. Goes on to say, for consider what great things He has done for you. 
Oh, when we start considering anything and everything that our God has done for us, the only thing left is to love him, to serve him. What great things he has done for you. You remember Psalm 126 and verse 3? The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. There's that gladness again. There's everything the Lord has done for us. The Lord has done great things for us. You remember when the demonic man, he was healed, and he wants to go with Jesus in Mark 5. Jesus has different plans for him. He says, you go home and you tell your friends what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy upon you. Go tell them. Go tell them what? What great things the Lord has done for us. Oh, at times we appear that we don't even understand the greatness of the gift of the Christ, the greatness of grace and mercy, compassion, what great things he's done for us. Anything that God does for us, everything he's done for us, it ranks up there as great. And you know what? Our service to him, we should strive not being in competition with each other, but to be the greatest servant we can be individually. Notice something else. Blessed is that servant who serves God with his family. I think we're all familiar with Joshua 24 and verse 15. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. The conclusion, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I want you to think about another verse. Serves God with his family. Write this verse down. And if you want to be encouraged this afternoon, go back and read. Now, I know these names are difficult in the Old Testament. Nehemiah, the third chapter. Someone has called that chapter the, the workingest chapter in the Bible. And with the exclusion of Genesis, the first chapter, God creating, I believe it ranks there. And if you're talking about just human activity, yes, it probably is the workingest chapter in all the Bible. And you're reading about men who are repairing the part of the house that is opposite or part of the wall that's opposite their house. But in the midst of this, we're going to see people who repair a section and then come back and say, we want another section. That kind of servant. But, but right there in the middle of it, in Nehemiah, the third chapter, and verse 12, you'll read about a man by the name of Shalom. He's the leader of half the district of Jerusalem. And here's what it says in that verse. He and his daughters made repairs. Can you think of a more precious statement to be made concerning Shalom? He and his daughters made repairs. They were right there with him serving. Blessed is that servant, again, who serves God with his family. Notice this next one. Blessed is that servant who serves with his brethren. Write down Zephaniah 3 and verse 9, talking about serving, and it says in the New American Standard Version, they served shoulder to shoulder. I love that phrase. Can't you just see the Jews in that day serving shoulder to shoulder? Can't you just see the Lord's church today doing the same thing? Serving, serving with their brethren, shoulder to shoulder. They've yoked themselves together. They're helping bear that burden. You remember in Galatians 5 and verse 13, we could state this, who serves with his brethren. We could just say, who serves his brethren. Through love, serve one another. So blessed is that servant who serves with his brethren. Blessed is that servant who serves his brethren. Matthew 23 and verse 11, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. He serves with his brethren. He serves his brethren. And notice this, blessed is that servant who understands that it's never vain 
to serve the Lord. You know, in the book of Malachi, some terrible a attitudes are exhibited by those people. In Malachi 1 and verse 13, my, how tiresome it is. They have been bringing the lame, the blind, the sick. They've just been giving God the scraps. God told them, give it to your governor, see if he will accept you. But their attitude, the reason why they did that is, my, how tiresome it is. God's way is tiresome. God's work, his labor, it's tiresome, it's boring. And then in Malachi 3 and verse 14, they would go on to say, it is vain to serve the Lord. How sad that is. When a person in the world views service to God Almighty in that capacity, and sadder still, when a once faithful brother or sister in Christ now assumes that position, it is vain to serve the Lord. Now, blessed is that servant who understands it's never vain to serve the Lord. Remember how the great resurrection chapter is concluded in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's never vain to serve the Lord. And blessed is that servant who understands that. And last but not least, notice this. Blessed is that servant who will never stop serving his Lord. Did you listen to the songs this morning? Tim led us in that one song, and there was a phrase in it. The phrase simply said, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. Blessed is that servant who realizes that. Blessed is that servant who will never stop serving the Lord. They're not like Demas. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Not like that at all. You remember in John the 6th chapter, in verse 66, many withdrew and were not following him anymore. The hymn of that context is Jesus. Many of those who had become disciples, they withdrew. They weren't following him. Jesus turns to his 12. He says, will you also go away? You know, if you look at that, we have the ability, the power, the prerogative to come to Jesus, and we have that same ability and will if we want to leave him. He's not going to force us. He doesn't force us to come. He will not force us to stay. And so he turns to his disciples, will you also go away? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter's saying, Lord... To leave now, to go away, I'd be a fool. Why would we ever do that? You know, there was a coach, Jimmy Valvano. I'm sure many of you, even if you didn't see him when he was coaching, you see him because of the tournaments, preseason tournaments, basketball, when they're being played. And, of course, he had cancer, lost that battle to cancer. But he was North Carolina uh, State's head basketball coach and I think it was 1983 he won the national championship in a speech that he gave battling that cancer uh, part of it is is always televised but seven words I want to call to your attention here's what he said don't give up don't ever give up now he's talking about in the battle of cancer we're talking about in our fight with sin don't give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever look back. Don't go back to the weak and beggarly elements of this world. Galatians 4 and verse 9. Don't be like that pig after washing returns to the wallering in the mire. Again, don't be like that dog returning to the vomit. Better for that man had he never known the way of righteousness than having once known it turned from the holy commandment delivered him. You know, I, I like a, a phrase even better than what Coach Valvano said. Winston Church.